Let's turn to uh, Exodus chapter 35. Then Moses, while you're getting there, I'll read it. Then Moses gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together and said to them, These are the words which the Lord has commanded you to do. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. God really puts a big, big store. He places a really big store on the Shabbat. Uh, you know, do we? Do we? You know, um, you know, as as I've as I've tried to work the Shabbat into my schedule, I've come to you know you know you, you start going you, you you begin doing the stuff that you see in the scriptures you you come here and you start incorporating a lot of this stuff and you you go okay I'll I'll do this I'll do this I'll do this and you you're, you're doing it out of obedience you know and there's there's an almost legal edge to it you know you you read it you see it's good and you do it but the more you know, the funny thing is the, the more you do these things that God tells you to do and the closer you get to the Lord, the more poignant these things are that he tells you to do. And the more, the more of a blessing, you know, we, we talk about blessing, but the real blessing is to be able to experience his presence, you know, to take that time and to just close yourself off and focus on his, on, on his, on his word, on, on, um, on the, the, the Parsha, what, whatever, but just focus your attention on him. I, I think our friends in Israel um, have a, a fairly good idea. Uh, they, they shut everything down. They, they turn off the tech. They, they may go a little bit too far for, for our, our purposes, but, but they've got the right idea. They shut things down and they separate themselves from the world and they, and they look at each other <laughs> and they relate to each other and they go for walks. You know, if you've ever been in, in Kedomim on the Shabbat, you know, you see all these people going for walks and, you know, I, when, when we first came here, people would say Shabbat Shalom and we're, oh yeah, Shabbat Shalom and that, that's, but, but when, when you're there in Israel, it makes sense. You know, people go for walks and you say, Shabbat Shalom. It, it's like, you know, good afternoon. It, it's, it's, it's kind of like we used to do in the, in the, at the turn of the century. We used to walk down the street. We used to greet each other. And there was, there was connection. And that's what God wants. He, he not only wants us to connect with him, but he wants us to connect with each other as well. And that's what the festivals, that's what the first festival, the Shabbat, is all about. So, um, and, and, and then in verse 3, I, I thought that was kind of interesting. You shall not... You, you shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. It's like, you know, and I started thinking about that. Why is that such a deal? I mean, I, I can't start a fire? But then I started thinking about it. And I, I don't know what, what, what you see or what you think, but it seems to me that when you start a fire, it's not just, you know, putting, putting fire together and, you know, setting it, you know, getting it all set up and, and lighting it. You have to split the wood. You have to cut the wood. You have to split it. And that's work. And God doesn't want us doing that. So he wants to make sure that, that all, of the, all of the wood is split and everything is, is there and that, that all the, you know, because if, if the, the fire doesn't start, you, 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 you go through conniptions trying to get it started and your, your blood pressure comes up and you get concerned. I mean, have you guys ever gone through that? You know, and especially if there are people expecting you to, to kindle this fire and, you know, you, you, you light it and it doesn't go and you go, oh, no, I didn't do it right. And you, you start going through all this, this long laundry list of things you need to do to get the thing going. Now, our friend Dennis, he just takes gasoline and pours it on and lights it and things go up. But I, I was a Boy Scout. I was an Eagle Scout. And we, we didn't do stuff that way. We called that Girl Scout water. And we, we would get down and just put it, you know, you, you, you'd put the, 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 the dry tinder and the, and the kindling and you'd, you'd get it bigger as it goes out. And you'd, you'd build this, this tower. You could do a teepee or you could do a box and, you, you know, you put it up like here and, and you, you fill the inside with tinder and you, you put tinder on the top so that when you light it, it really goes. And, uh, and I, I think the Lord wanted that to, to happen before the Shabbat. So that you didn't have to worry about it. You lit it and all the wood was there and you could just put it, you know. He, he didn't say that, not have a fire. He said not, not to kindle, not, not to get it started, I think. I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, um, and then we, we get into the offering of the tabernacle. And it's really kind of cool. Um, 
Let's turn, uh, well, <laughs> you've got a different version than I do. Uh, verse 4, and Moses spoke uh, to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying, take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood. I, I, I know where they might have gotten the acacia wood, but a lot of this stuff, you know, I, I still wonder where, you know, scratch my head, wonder where it's come, coming from. The, the badger skins may be, what, what are the name of the, the rock badgers that, that you see in En Gedi? Um, I forget what the names are. Uh, but perhaps that was what it was, or perhaps there was something else. Brother Larry, what's... A, yeah, Really? Large pieces of skin make a very, very fine leather. And that's what they're instructed to do is use a fine leather to make the outer covering. So it's probably oh. Egon skin. Huh. That's why they're extinct. <laughs> no, Stellar Sea Cow is extinct. That's right. The dugongs are still around. So that must have been that must have been something that, that they brought from from, from Egypt. So anyway, you know, think about that. You know, how, how resourceful the children of Israel had to be. You know, the God, and, and God must have given them, each one of them, insight into what to ask for. You know, I mean, because all, all this stuff, I mean, where in the world, um, you know, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet, thread, fine linen, you know, they, they had to carry this, carry this with them into the wilderness. Uh, spices for the anointing oil for the sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. You know, where did this stuff come from? They were, they were um, resourceful, you know? And what, what can we take away from this? You know, how resourceful are we with the opportunities that God gives us? You know, we, we or, or even, you know, even beginning with, with our study in the Word. You know, we, we come to a roadblock, we come to something we don't understand, and we go, okay, it's e easy to just to jump to something else, but, but how, how tenacious are we to, 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 to mine the truth in the word? You know, do, do we have resources? Do, do we use our concordance? Do we, do we have um, um, uh, other things that we, the, 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 um, the internet, you know? Yeah. How, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is how hungry are we for excellence? How hungry are we for excellence in understanding the word? How hungry are we to know exactly what God says so we can apply it to our lives in the proper way? Um, let's everyone turn to 2 Corinthians 9. Second Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 11. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving enough for God. Okay, what's, what's he saying here? He says that there, there, has to be, there has to be a belief that what you're doing is going to bring something. And how many of you ever tried to, to sort of work that up, you know? Um, you sort of, okay, you know, I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to sow my seeds and, and God will bless me. But I, I think, you know, as, as I get older and as I walk with the Lord, the, the, more I, the more I get into who he is, the more I realize that this cheerful giver thing comes because we spend time with him. We, we, he becomes so important to us and his word to us you know, we, so how, how many times do you hear things in the back of your mind as you're going through things and you just sort of pass them off? Oh, that, that's just me. That's just me. How many of you have thought that that might be the Lord speaking to you? 
You know, how many of you have, have talked to a brother or a sister or, or someone at work and you've, you've seen that they've, they're really good at what they do and it, it crosses your mind, they're really good at what they do. I should say something to them and, they, and you don't say it. You don't do it. And I'm beginning to learn that a lot of these little promptings are not just my mind going on around, you know, just, just going, popping things up, but it, it could be the Lord saying, hey, so, so and so, you know, you're seeing this in someone. Tell them. Encourage them. Show them that you care. Because God, see, that's, that's what, what we're going to get to as, as we, we get further on in this chapter. God wants to bring us together. And he wants us to, to work together, to bring who we are in, into the mix and, and to give what we have to give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, but he wants us to, to trust him, to open our eyes to see the value of what we're doing. So it's not, we're not doing it for us, we're doing it for other people, for, for the needs of others, for the needs of the body. Because, and it says, you know, we don't have to go, go trying to take care of ourselves. God is able to make all grace abound towards you. Like, this is something that goes on in the background. This is something that goes on as you're, you're putting yourself aside and you're doing what he shows you to do. He begins to bless. And, you don't, it, and it becomes something that overcomes you rather than something that you're seeking. So, um, anyway, let, let's get back to, uh, to Exodus 35. All who are gifted artisans among you, uh, 3510, all who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tent, its covering, its clasp, its boards, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, etc. All of these things, they were... Um, these, these artisans were gifted. Let's, uh, let's jump to verse 21. Then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing and they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting for all its service and for the holy garments. They came, both men and women, as many as had a willing heart and brought earrings and nose rings and rings and necklaces, all jewelry of gold, etc., etc., etc. You know, I, I often thought, you know, there, there are passages, I, I'm not sure it, it's here, but there's, I, I think when, um, when Aaron is making the golden calf, um, the, the, it, it says that the people came and they, they actually took off these, these accoutrements. They, 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 they took off their earrings and their bracelets and their nose rings. Uh, and I'm thinking, they're out in the middle of nowhere. You know, and, 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 and they're dressing up like Egyptians. You know, they're, they're, they're wearing all this, all this stuff. But, but I, I, I guess they, they wanted to impress each other, you know. I mean, they were Jewish after all. We want to impress each other. Um, but uh, be that as it may. Um, but the thing is, uh, and in verse 26, it says, all the women whose heart stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goats hair, etc. What, what we see here, is a group of people who somehow caught a vision for what God was doing. They were, they were fresh, fresh through the miracles. Um, they, they had seen God move over and over and over and over again in Israel, I mean, in Egypt. And then they saw him part the Red Sea. And not only parting the Red Sea, they walked across on dry land. And then, not only did they walk across on dry land, but as they cleared these areas, Pharaoh and his horsemen were following them, and the waters fell on them while they were still going across. I mean, imagine seeing this. Okay, we don't necessarily see the Red Sea parting anymore. But we can ask God for, for something supernatural. We can ask him for opportunities to see the supernatural so that we can get excited so that we, we come, you know, it, um, uh, uh, often I've, I've wanted to share that scripture that says, whenever you, whenever you come together, as a matter of fact, I have it right here. Um, uh, let's look at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. First Corinthians 14, verse 26. Someone want to read that? Go to, ver, go to 27. Anybody? Well, my brothers and sisters, let's summarize. When you assemble, one will sing, another will teach, another will tell some special revelation God has given, one will speak in tongues, and another will interpret what is said. But everything that is done must edify all of you. No more than two or three who speak in tongues, they must speak one at a time. 
Okay, thank you. Um, the, the Greek word for edification means building. It's building. So the idea is, I have prepared my heart a lot the last couple of weeks because of the things that I've been called to do in service to the congregation. But just because I'm visible in what I do doesn't mean that what I'm doing is more important than what God can lay on your hearts. See, what Paul is saying here is that when you come together, you're prepared to share something. You should be as tenacious in grabbing a hold of God and saying, give me something, God, that I can share when I come together in the body. If you came so, so prepared, thusly prepared, do you think worship might explode a little bit more? Do you, do you think your heart will be prepared to, to come and just explode before the Lord? But see, it takes time during the week. It takes commitment during the week. And we have to do that. We have to understand. Each one of us, just, just like these, these people in, in, in this, this passage here, Everyone came whose heart was stirred. Well, it's okay if you, if you wake up on Thursday morning or Friday morning and say, God, my heart's not stirred. My heart's not stirred. You know, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So if you come to him in humility, you better believe he'll do something for you. He'll give you something. He'll give you a scripture. But you have to take the time to give him something to work with. You know, crack your Bible once in a while, you know. Um, you know, take, take the time to, to look in the Word and, and to, to, to start the day in, in the Word or, or to spend time, you know, say you're traveling, you know, listen to the Bible on, on, uh, on CD or, or on, on your phone or something. But the idea is God wants each one of us to know that we're invaluable to the work that he wants to do. But more than that, he wants us to know that he is unable to do what he wants to do if we sit on the pews and we do nothing. I'm sure if, if anyone of, any one of us took the time to think about it, there are things that he's, he's shown us that we can do. There are things that he's shown us that, that we're, we're gifted at. And we just need to say, God, how do, I, how do we begin to process this in the midst of the body? How do you want me to process this in the midst of the body? What, what can I do? And then come in with, eye, with ears, ears of radar so that when, when you talk to someone, God will say, say this to them. When, when you see someone that they have a need, give them something. You know? I mean, this can get exciting. You know, If we start expecting God to say things and do things, and if we expect to, to see manifestation, we, see, God can't manifest himself supernaturally if we don't give him something to work with. We've got to give them that. Amen. We've got to be willing to, 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 to be stupid, to be crazy. Yes. We've, we've got to be willing to make fools of ourselves. Yes. You know, I, I, I tell the, the, the dancers that I work with, I, I, I tell the, the, the kids that I, I, I work with at, at the opera and in drama, um, if you're not afraid to make a fool of yourself, forget about the theater. There's no use for you. Because when, whenever you go to a... To a uh, a play, whenever you go to a, uh, a ballet performance, whenever you go to an opera or anything like that, you are looking for people who are totally involved, who, are, who you look at and you go, I can relate to them because they are completely into what they're doing. And he calls us to be that way as believers. We've got to be so totally into God that we're real, that when we, say, when we come into a situation, we, we don't just have to make praise happen. We, we've been seeing him move all week long. We can praise because it's just bubbling up out, sorry, it's, it's just bubbling out of us. Let's look at verse 30. And Moses said to the children of Israel, see the Lord has called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, and, and the, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and understanding, in knowledge and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. Where did, where did they get that training? Where do you think? 
the gifts God gave them. Egypt, thank you, Micah. What were they in Egypt? Slaves. They were slaves in Egypt. But God used their time in Egypt to prepare them for the art that would display who he was. Let me, let me suggest that if you feel like you're a slave in your job, if you feel like you're a slave in your whatever position you find yourself, learn what God wants you to learn there. Learn what he's, what he's put you there to learn. And recognize that what you're learning there is going to be useful in the body. It's going to be useful for him. Um, I, I read a book once that said secular work is full-time service. Because I, we, we were a part of a full-time ministry and uh, um, we came away from that and I went into full-time work, secular work, and I felt like I was throwing my life away. You know, oh God, you know, just, and the Lord started to show me little by little that no, you're not throwing your life away. You're, you're to bloom where I plant you. You're to learn from me where you are. Not only that, but you're to give fruit to those around you, the people that you work with. This is an opportunity for you to, you may be the only Bible that these people ever read. And he's, and so I began to see that. And, and as, as I read this, I, I started to see that that's what God wants, at least tonight, I think that's what God wants us to get out of these, these two chapters, 35 and 36. Because these people, um, these, these guys had, had gifting. They were talented. But they had to do something to, 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 to work it so that it was useful to them. You know, um, yes, talent is good, but I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you more for someone who works hard and, and does something than someone who has talent and sits on it. But we don't know what kind of talents we have if we don't pursue them, if we don't practice, if we don't work at it. You're going to have to pray about pride, my brother, but that, that, that guy over there has been working and working and working and working. He had the talent, but that talent just didn't sit there. He practiced, and he practiced, and he practiced. He's blowing me out of the water here. Blowing me out of the water. And yes, it's, it's God working through him. But if he didn't practice, God couldn't do that. And see, that's what he calls us to do. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, right? Excellence. You know, it's time for us to shed the... the uh, um, um, the, the, the ho-humness. You, know, you never know I'm a writer. I can't think of these words when I need them. Um, but he, he wants us to be engaged. He wants us to give everything that we have. He, God gave everything he had. He gave us Messiah Yeshua. Do we owe him any less? We need to start considering. We need to start every morning going, God, how can I change the way I'm living so that I give you everything? What, and what does everything mean? You know, because you know, we, he may want, we may want to give up something, but he says, no, 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 no. You, you just need to stay there and work harder at it. Or, you know, this is a dead work. Stop, stop living for your emotions and, and, and start focusing on something else. We need to be, we need to have that kind of, of connectivity with the Lord so that his emotions, his thoughts are our thoughts. You know, we, we, need, to, we need to go to him and, and, and do a, a Vulcan mind meld, you know, my mind to your mind, your thoughts to my thoughts, you know. Um, it, you guys ever see, uh, you know, the one of, I, I think what's, what's called the voyage home where, where Spock is, is, is swimming in a, in a big pool and he comes up to a whale and he's doing a, a Vulcan mind meld with, with, with the whale and, you know, it's really funny. Um, it's really funny. But, but maybe we need to do a, a Vulcan mind meld with God, you know? Like, my mind to your mind, yes. your thoughts to my thoughts, you know? Um, let's, uh, let's look at verse 30. 
uh, Exodus 35, verse 30. And Moses said to the children of Israel, see the Lord, has, oh, I've, I've already read that, haven't I? Uh, <laughs> okay. And it's at 34, and he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him and Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach, the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do all manner of work, the engraver and the designer. For the service of, and, and Bezalel, verse chapter 36, Bezalel and Aholiab, and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. They had, they had been prepared, so they were ready. They were painstakingly prepared. And then, um, Verse 2 of 36, that Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service and making the sanctuary. They had a vision. They had, I, and I, I think Aholiab and, and um, Bezalel, as they maybe presented their their drawings, as they, as they presented their, 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 their work, people got excited. People began to catch a, catch a vision, you know, and they got excited about it. You know, like, like when Brother Larry started bringing, bringing things together and, you know, he, his, the work he did, the research he did, and the hard work he did began to spread and the congregation gathered around that and they, and they created this, this wonderful thing that, that, that's, a, that's an outreach. S some of you are here tonight because of that outreach, or because of friends who went to that outreach. Um, but I think God wants us to go farther, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, oh, in, um, in uh, the second year class, we were talking about the road to Emmaus and the, 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 the disciples who were going to, to Emmaus, and, you know, Jesus but it looked like he was going to go further. And um, I think he wants us to to recognize that, that, you know, to take him seriously, you know? I mean, it's, it's time for us to stop living spiritual cliches and, and start really asking ourselves, what, what does the word mean? What does this word mean for me? And how do I go about applying this? You know, what, what, is, it really, what is it really saying? You know, some of us have, have read these words over and over and over again. They don't mean anything. They, they give us a warm fuzzy and that's it. But a lot of these words mean change. They, they mean we're going to have to turn ourselves inside out. And we're going to start having to, to, to live life differently. But God's promise is there. Amen. What Haven? Well, I, I started a day off praying for dunamis. Praying for? Dunamis. dunamis. Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 So um, I, I had a number of, of videos uh, on building the tabernacle, but um, sure. Well, no. What happened? I'm, I'm going to jump. Jump to uh, verse, uh, chapter 39, verse 32. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses. So they did, and they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its boards. Basically, they did the work. No, it, it'll take too long. It'll take too long. Uh, I've, I've got, I've, I've researched and all of the, all of the, the, the construction I've, I've got in this PowerPoint, but I don't want to keep you, and it'll be a long, it, it's, you know, they're about three, three minutes a piece and there are about eight or nine of them. So um, if you want to see it, let me know and I'll be happy to play it for you. Um, but the people of Israel, you know, in, in verse, in chapter 39 and 40, they, they bring all the work and they put it together. And let's go to chapter 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go on, onward on all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. The work that the people did gave God a place to dwell. But not only to dwell, but to showcase who he was. All of the things that they did, the people came together, they worked hard, they created this, and the presence of God was there. Power from on high, even as Haven was talking about. Let's start living our lives and building this tabernacle. Let's see ourselves as essential parts and what, what we can add to the, the congregation as absolutely essential for what God wants to do. Because when the people of Israel gave their best, God gives his best. And his, the power of God was so powerful, Moses could not even go in. If you can't get a vision for that on your own, go before the Lord. Pray and fast. Do what you need to do. But recognize that this is absolutely essential. We have to get a vision for our lives, both before the Lord and in the midst of the congregation. And then once he gives us that vision, we have to throw fear to the wind and say, okay, I'm going to make a fool of myself. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to try. You know, Be, be prepared when, when you come, when, when you come to, uh, to service. You know, have a scripture. Have a song. You know, you're, again, you know, we're, we're going to have to, we're, we're gonna have to be, be wise and we're going to have to make sure that what you bring fits in what the Lord is doing. But at the same time, if you have it and God says, you know, chances are if God tells you to, to bring it and, and he opens the door for it, it'll, it'll minister. And the more we do this, the more exciting these meetings are going to be. And, and, and the more people are going to want to come. Because they, you know, you, you don't have to send invitations to a fire. People see a fire, they come and they come, come looking. Let's, let's let the fires, let, let's get, let God kindle a fire in our hearts first. And once he kindles it in us, let's, let's pass it, you know. On. There was a, there was a girl, I don't know if you, any of you came to the Lord in the 70s, early 70s, but her name was Ann Kimmel. And she used to like to end her, end her speeches. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. And soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you spread his love to everyone. You want to pass it on. What a wondrous time is spring when all the leaves are budding. The birds begin to sing, the flowers start their blooming. That's how it is with God's love. Once you've experienced it, you want to sing. It's fresh like spring. You want to pass it on. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>